you're still an entrepreneur because you're taking the risk of joining a company at the early stage and probably taking a massive pay cut and based on the looks, you, you're not, you're taking a massive pay cut. The, um, what I'm gonna show you today uh, is not a pitch on Skycatch, but uh, a message from uh, our team on how we built it uh, from the ground up. Uh, we created this video for our own internal two year anniversary uh, and it's very private. So we're, we're gonna share that with you. And also um, a little background on Skycatch. We started two years ago. Uh, in my little bedroom, um, and I, uh, I raised three million on seed funding, raised 10 million on Series A, uh, ended up raising close to 20 million, and now we're close to uh, closing our Series B, the big round. Uh, very humbling because we started very small and very challenging process where a lot of people just did not believe that we would get to the point that we're at today. And it's pretty much what you go through every day, and that's why I wanted to share our story and see if it resonates. Well, first of all, thank you to my backup singers over there. <laughs> this was created by them. Thank you, guys. I think that when I started Skycatch, I couldn't even imagine being where I'm at today. It started off with me not believing that it was just about the drone. It was more about the content that you can get from a drone. I had the conviction that having a lot of imagery every day will not only spark their creativity, but it will give birth to other ways of doing things. Early, early days was more about showing the investors that we had the right team in place. So the first project that I asked the team to work on was to follow the laser. So that was fascinating and that got so many investors excited. Early 2013, we had our first spotlight opportunity with TechCrunch. We had a taco copter developed by Will Pryor to basically drop a taco <laughs> on stage. That was the first time we were on stage talking about Skycatch. And shortly after that, we had a, uh, a dead box. Dead box came from me reaching out to Aaron Livy on Twitter, and he invested immediately. And shortly after that day was the day where uh, Rich Levendorf, he pulled me aside and said, look, we want to come in. Well, now, we had some incredible challenges during that time. We didn't have a ground station ready to show investors. And I remember calling Sam around January, I said, look, I need you to step in and you need to make this happen and you need to make it happen by January 31st. <laughs> we were working 24 seven. I even have a picture where uh, Fran was sleeping on top of a ground station and we made it happen. January 31st, we had our first trials and we had a full battery swap. It was flawless. It was uh, our first big engineering win. After that, we spent maybe two, three weeks starting the fundraising process. Ground Station became integral to Series A. It was the missing piece in this fully automated data pipeline. And once we were able to... Oh. <laughs> that was on purpose? Just kidding. Let's see, let me see if I can refresh and go back to the same frame. Skycatch? <laughs> I even have a picture where uh, ten, maybe two, three. I made a data pipeline, and once we were able to make it, we were able to bring investors in and show them that what was next in the future for drones was these ground stations where the drones come and land, nobody has to come there and take out their batteries or get the SD cards for data. We had a fully functioning robot that was going to take care of that for clients. And once investors saw that, they saw that this was a company that was going to go far. The product has grown, uh, the team members have grown, we've added a lot more people and even when we add more people we've been able to keep this hungry startup attitude. What's been incredible is just how things have come together and seeing the team grow, but then also seeing all the validation in the market. The first time Kawasu came in, um, and this being probably one of the biggest deals that we have today, I remember just listening to him and how he was explaining how he wanted to integrate Skycatch into their machinery. And I honestly couldn't believe it. It was the first time ever that I had experienced a bigger company wanting us rather than us going out and trying to teach them. 
The thing that makes uh, Skycatch really unique for me is uh, how we are uh, revolutionizing and, and, and not even reinventing, we are inventing a brand new industry from scratch. I think the kinds of technologies, tools that Skycatch is developing could really be a game changer. Imagine it as a as a flying platform that can carry whatever sensors you want for applications that you are interested in. It's been really amazing to see Skycatch grow from where it was at the very beginning at Runway where things were really crazy and um, kind of very impromptu to now where things are like more structured, we're growing, we've signed huge deals, we're now associated with like, enormous companies. And it's been really cool to see that journey. What I really like about working at Skycatch is the challenge. When I joined this job, I definitely did not take it because it was easy and there's the right mix of difficulty and attainability. As Christian says, we're humble, nimble, and reliable. I'm really excited to be a part of this company. I really see that the opportunities for this company in order to take drones where they've never been are limitless and I'm really excited to see where we go next. You know, being able to be here with the team and celebrating our second year, it's pretty amazing. Looking back and, and seeing everything that we've accomplished collectively as a team, people look at it from the outside and they just can't believe it. But if it wasn't for the fact that we had probably have the most incredible, fast-moving, passionate, skycatcher athletes, we wouldn't be able to make it happen, but we did. And we will be doing so much more because of who we are. All right, now off to the presentation. So that video took two years to make. <laughs> Just kidding. The, um, so, um, a little, little history of how we got where we're at today. Um, today, uh, first of all, we are working with some of the biggest construction um, heavy machinery makers in the world. Very humbling, like I said earlier, and uh, very challenging because they push a lot. Um, and uh, we started off in a small little office, uh, worked really hard to validate what we were building with customers. And, um, and a lot of the bets that we took, and as an entrepreneur, you take a lot of bets early on. A lot of the, a lot of the bets we took uh, were, turned out to be correct. Uh, now, we stumbled on the, a lot. There's a lot of periods where it was very stressful. Uh, Christmas weren't Christmas. Uh, in, in fact, last year, uh, this year, last Christmas, Komatsu asked us to deploy, and we sent a, a team of engineers. They had to skip vacation. We skipped Christmas, but it just, that's, just, that's just the name of the game for us and for all entrepreneurs. So early on, I, um, I spent a lot of time just going around trying to figure out if, uh, if there's a use case for this. So um, that's the 49ers uh, stadium, and I infiltrated that stadium a couple of times. I just bought a hard hat and a vest and steel toe boots, and I pretended I was one of the workers, and I would go in. And uh, I got kicked out a few times, but I got, in, I got in after I got a few names. So I pretended I was a worker. And then pretty much eventually they just let me in. And I was collecting data, and I was giving data to them every day for free. Uh, through that process, I learned a lot. They taught me a lot. I, I made friends. And through that process, I also got my first deal. Skanska offered to buy one of our units that didn't exist, actually. It was in my imagination. Uh, but I was like, I'll, I'll get on it. We're going to have a team work on it that didn't have a team. So that email got my first investor, you know, wow, you got a first deal, no products. That's incredible. Um, and I ended up raising uh, $3 million through Google Ventures, FFVC, who's here in New York. And um, we started hiring people. Um, I've been, I've been around for a while. I've been a software engineer. Uh, I've been a CTO for a couple companies, for the uh, last three companies, startups. And I've been through the process of you know, growing teams, which is really tough. And I've been through that process, polishing the process of building teams. And I, I feel really strongly about when you build teams, you gotta choose very wisely. You can't, even one person can change everything. 
Um, so we have the, the motto of hiring humble, nimble, and reliable. Uh, that attitude is everything. Uh, when it comes to teamwork, you know, you have four people working together. If one person doesn't have the right attitude, it just throws everything off. So through that, uh, and the, the concept of we hire athletes, uh, we've been able to hire incredible teams. And if you go to our office, every single person that goes in, they say, wow, you know, the team just seems so dynamic and energetic, so nice and, and nice. And, and, and they ask me, how did you build this team? And, and it really, it just we said no to a lot of people. No to a lot of great resumes, a lot of great backgrounds. And we just kept the ones who were high potential and great attitude. Um, so going back to my early days, um, I spent a lot of time at construction sites, at mining companies. I was down in Boron, California. I went into a mine and told them I needed to take some photos for marketing and, uh, for, of an open pit mine. It was all not true, but uh, I went in with my hard hat. They let me in, and I pulled off a drone, and it just got everyone's attention. That was Rio Tinto. Uh, three months later, we signed a contract with them. So it was li little, slowly, by, little by little, we were finding ways to get there in front of people who needed the data. Uh, with Rio Tinto specifically, I remember sitting down with them, and this is actually the first time we actually visited the site. I remember sitting down with them and, and just looking at all the tools in, middle, in the Mojave Desert, middle of nowhere, and realizing that there were so many opportunities to, for innovation. Not just the stuff that we were providing, but you sit down and you see all the really old tools they use that are very expensive and very hard to use. And I wish I, I could have snapshot that moment and sent it to all the entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley because that was the moment that I saw, wow, there's so many things you can actually innovate here. But then I went on to uh, sell the Skycatch uh, solution. But then I looked back and said, wow, if, I, I wish I would spend more time with people on the field and learning because there's so much opportunity, which I encourage everybody to actually do that. So we have three core values, humble, nimble, and reliable. Um, you, know, as, you know, as we grew, uh, it, was, it became very vital for us to maintain some sort of core culture. And uh, our culture embodies the, the, the concept of being humble, nimble, and reliable. The, the, num the humble portion of it is being able to take criticism, being able to give criticism, be assertive, um, and take it as you're doing the best for the company. And being nimble is be willing to wear multiple hats. You don't need to hire a team of 20 people to do something that may take two. Um, that's the nimble part. And reliable is commitment. If you commit to deliver on a date, you commit. And that commitment drives you to de-scope features, to get more people involved, to collaborate, to get teamwork going. And I think all those three things uh, led us to be where we're at today. Um, you know, we talk about competition. Um, you know, this is something that started because a lot of people, um, it started becoming a topic because there's a lot of drone companies out there and we call ourselves a data company. And I told the team that, you know, there's still the market still not big enough to talk about competition. Maybe competition for investors, but today the, the market's so small, we encourage other companies to actually go out and build drone companies so that we can grow the market. And we, once we grow the market's big enough, then we start worrying about competition. So I tell, I tell people is that we are our own competition. I emailed everybody and I said, our competition is out there creating amazing stories, are out, are out there in the field learning from customers, are out there uh, closing deals, are hiring incredible people, and they're not worrying about us at all. That's our competition. And that doesn't exist today. So if you see an article on TechCrunch, ignore it. You know, just focus on making sure the client is happy. So the last thing I want to leave with you with is the fact that uh, it's really important as a company and as an entrepreneur, I say, you know, I say this all the time, everybody in the company are entrepreneurs. They're taking a risk. Um, you know, our goal, for instance, is to build a smarter world. Um, today we're working with some of the craziest, fastest, biggest companies in the world, and we're providing data analytics of actionable intelligence that's making their process 10 times faster. Uh, some of these companies that we're working with have saved them three months worth of construction. Uh, some of the things we do is very advanced comparison analytics between CAD files against our maps. 
I can't really show you everything today because there's a lot of, to show you, but a lot of the data analytics is our secret sauce. So have a big vision so that everyone subscribes to something much bigger than what you're doing today. So they know that what you're doing today is just a fraction of something much bigger. And, um, and that's basically Skycatch. Thank you. Thank you very much. What can you tell us uh, about the, the product itself? So I realize some of it is uh, stuff you can talk about, but um, is there a right way to think about it as a vertically integrated solution where you have the base station, you have the drone, you have the data uh, capture and the data processing layer? That's right. So we build the hardware and the software from the ground up. So the full solution from the ground station that uh, gives you the ability to land fully autonomously. So for instance, Sky, uh, Komatsu has 45,000 job sites in Japan alone. So that would require 45,000 people. So with robots, you can, you can deploy 45,000 robots. You don't have to hire that many people. Uh, and you can have the people focus on the data itself instead of worrying about flying. So our solution is an end-to-end -end solution, starting with the robot, the, the box, it lands, takes off. It's a full, fully custom software running on our, on our drone itself. And also the technology that lets the, uh, it's like a beam that pulls it into a box. And then it takes off after it gets recharged. And then we send the data. We also have own the, the entire processing stack. We believe we have the fastest processing stack for 3D models and for precision. And then beyond that, we extract a lot of, a lot of information from the maps. That's the secret sauce about, we create trends of how quickly you're building things and we give you predictive data about like what you should you do if this changes or if this moves, which contractors are getting paid and all that stuff. And, and, and that goes to uh, what you were saying about the drone being a, a data capture mechanism, right? I think part of your thesis is that people actually don't care where the uh, information comes from. It could come from a plane, it could come from like anything. Uh, drones just happen to be a, a very convenient and cheap way of doing it, but at the end of the day, you deliver Insights. That's right. <clears throat> Early on, the uh, autopilot technology was, wasn't very evolved. We had a lot of issues with these drones taking off, crashing, and um, we ended up forking the code and writing ourselves, cleaning up all the bugs, but then we realized that the, the main core was evolving, but we had a stack that was not evolving. And so we decided to take on the full stack, get, you know, build the hardware, build the software, and own the problem. And, and part, of, part of doing that is really just having full control of the full stack from, from the hardware, from the software, all the way down to the processing, to the analytics. I don't know if I, I missed yeah. you. Yeah. The, um, during the early days, it was really tough because there wasn't anything out there that we can use that was reliable. Um, you know, the engineers did not want to go into building this stuff completely from scratch because we're not a drone company. Uh, we're great at software, we figured it out, and now we actually have probably the best autopilot in the market today. And we have a lot, the biggest licensing deal for another company that's using our software. And, but we're, we're a data company. Most of the staff in the company are data, data miners. You know, they're processing, they're trying to figure out how, how to make workflows more effective and safer for these large industries. Um, and you know, who knows, someday, you know, some other big company wants to build a ground station and a drone. We'll let them do it, and then we'll continue focusing on the data. Very interesting, right? This seems to be a characteristic of the new market, right? You find people, because it's sort of the same thing with Nest, right? Like when they build this sort of integrated full stack product and uh, now evolving to a platform. Uh, I want to open to questions. Loudly, and then could you repeat the question? Absolutely. So, when you started, did you know, think drones and then construction, or construction and then drones? <clears throat> when I started, uh, first of all, I was doing this event called Drone Games. Uh, it was a hackathon for, um, I was part of the team that built the software for an SDK for these like underground hackathons around the world. Uh, where we actually create, a, you know, autonomous, you know, we had a Torero where we actually have a red thing and the, the drone would charge towards it, you know. So it was all based on image manipulation. Uh, and we believe that uh, quickly we realized that it was going to be all of it is going to be about gathering that data. Today, there's no way of gathering that data in real time everywhere unless you have fixed cameras. 
but gathering from multiple angles. So when I went out there looking around for opportunities, I didn't think about the drone. The drone was just a tool. You know, I thought about who's going to use this data, right? So I went around and looked at, you know, I ran into a construction site. It, the first one that I went into was the Palo Alto Medical Foundation Center. It's already pr uh, fully built, but if you go to Angelus, you'll see some early photos I took from that. And I went in there, I was like, wow, they must be using photos here. And then I looked around and everybody was like pulling out their phones and taking photos everywhere. I was like, okay. So then I flew it and, you know, five minutes later, we got a whole bunch of people around me. And then that's when I started working with them. It was crazy. That's a great question. How much of that is a 3D analysis or a point cloud depth analysis? Uh, definitely both. So we create, we render a 3D model, then we create all the point cloud. Especially for Komatsu, uh, we create one centimeter resolution. So you got to have that level of um, uh, resolution because you got to send the dozers and you, it has to be perfect. So what it does is really cool. When you, so I just got back from Japan. You see the ground stations take off, it maps the entire area and it lands and you see the dozer taking off and start moving dirt around. And then the dozer sends the GPS coordinates that, that it, uh, from, from the route and then we actually go up again and just map that area and re-stitch it together. It's really cool. So that's, that's what I believe is going to be construction of the future. Everything is going to be automated. This one over there. <clears throat> one centimeter. One centimeter. One. Resolution. resolution, yeah. Yeah, it's a. Uh, the resolution was something that was a little tougher to uh, get it down to one centimeter, but it required a lot of markers and some, some creative uh, processes to get it done. I don't know, um, that's a great question, how, yeah, actually, can you ask? Uh, question was how ultimately you'd like your, your analytics to be consumed, whether it's standalone software packages or um, augmenting tools and workflows and so forth already being done by your customers? Mm, I think, you know, that's a great question. I think both, uh, we're, we're learning from customers. Uh, we're trying not to build based on what we believe they need. Um, as they demand things, we just feed them a little bit of data and then they come back with a lot of features and demands. And uh, we also do not do surveys. We do not ask them what they want us to build. We observe. So for instance, uh, we're building, we're embedded in this very iconic building that's being built in, um, in Cupertino by a very iconic company. So uh, we're embedded there and we're listening. So for instance, the, uh, the, the, the uh, feature that lets you upload CAD files and, and map them and compare them into those, those maps in real time. That was because we were just walking around and just listening. So I tell all the product guys, just listen, don't ask what they want. Just listen and then we start adding stuff to it. One of them was these massive meetings with all the contractors and all the planners where their contractors are like, well, you told us to build it this way. The planners are like, no, the maps, the, the, the architectural plans say this. And you know, a, you know, pipeline going in the wrong direction, or the electrical wire going in the wrong direction, and then the next team needs to start working on the next layer, and they can't because these guys messed it up. So a lot of that happens, and we prevent that by doing real-time analysis and checks on that. Uh, as far as the packages, I don't know. I mean, we're right now we're just adding based on what we see is the most valuable piece, and then uh, and then we, who knows where we're, where we're going to end up. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, in fact, it's something that, yeah, so are we doing anything with vertical buildings? You know, once you get the, the flat areas out of the way and these buildings start to go up, do you do anything with it? And it's actually something we're doing with this company and a few other companies. We're, that, it's a little different uh, method. We actually fly around it, camera is pointing towards it, and it creates, creates a 3D model. In fact, 
We're also doing indoor mapping and using the same tools for comparing and uh, attaching and measuring uh, using, but we're not flying a drone in sight. We actually created a 3D array camera, pass it to an intern, and then he's basically creating these like map, street map view look, looking things that, and it's all for just augmenting the ability to, uh, you know, do things faster. It's a great question. Uh, and last question from me. Uh, interested in the, I guess, the, the legal aspect of this. So I know that one of your customers, Bechtel, got some kind of exemption. Um, what, what's the current situation for B2B business like this? <clears throat> That's another great question. Um, so early on, uh, it was really tough to to raise money because of you know the regulation aspect, and uh, I, I kept telling investors, you know, everything is going to work itself out. Uh, we have good relationship. You know, obviously, I didn't. I was just hoping that things would work itself out, and uh, yeah. And but we had we believed that companies at some point would want to use this data and it would be companies pushing the FA to change regulations is that's exactly what happened and a year ago we took a different approach most companies and most drone makers were going against the FA and fighting it and trying to you know trying to fight it in in, in Washington and I said I kept telling people nothing gets done in Washington so don't go there you're wasting your time and so instead we made a lot of friends with the FA and we started teaching them about what we were doing internally and then we told them look we're not because what we did is we gave the drone for free and these guys were flying in their own private property and we just charged them for the data analytics so that was that's how we got through the whole FAA thing so they couldn't do anything to us and we told them look we have these massive companies wanting to use the data and we incentivized you know Bechtel was just announced and Bechtel early early on didn't want us to tell anybody that we were talking to them. They were extremely picky about our, us mentioning Bechtel anywhere uh, because they didn't, ha they didn't want the public to see drone and Bechtel and security, safety and all the stuff. Now we just made a huge press release so things have changed dramatically. And when people ask about regulation, it's not going to be based on what we're writing today or what we want today. It's what the companies, massive companies are going to demand. Uh, I told Clayco, for instance, was the first one that filed an exemption with the FAA. And we believe that we were part of the creation of the 333 exemption process because we got these companies to actually send letters to the FAA and they were terrified. We actually covered a lot of legal costs for writing these letters and we finally got one company to agree and then we told them, look, Clayco did it, you should do it. And now we have Chevron, we filed with Chevron, we have Bechtel, um, we have DPR, some of the most, the biggest BP. So um, with that momentum, it got the FA really worried. You know, the FA is a very poor organization. They can go to court with some massive company. And now these companies know that. <laughs> all right, so that's all the time we have. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.